Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. Today we're talking with Kaylee Perret Shaughnessy about the poet John Greenleaf Whittier, namesake of the Whittier Bridge in Ossipee. Kaylee tells us the story of how a young Massachusetts poet transitioned from a fierce abolitionist to one of America's most beloved fireside poets, and how his name became attached to a New Hampshire covered bridge. Here we go. In this episode, we'll learn about the poet John Greenleaf Whittier, namesake of the Whittier Covered Bridge in Ossipee. The current Whittier Bridge was constructed around 1870, shortly before the nationally acclaimed poet began summering along the Bear Camp River. Today we're speaking with Kaylee Perret Shaughnessy, Executive Director of the Whittier Birthplace in Haverhill, Massachusetts, where Whittier was born in 1807. Kaylee has over 10 years of experience with small museums in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Alaska. She's worked in museum education, collections management, exhibits, and more. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in anthropology from Bates College and a Master of Liberal Arts in Museum Studies from Harvard University Extension School. Outside of work, she enjoys skiing, reading, and spending time at her family's lake house on Ossipee Lake. Welcome to the podcast, Kaylee. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Many of New Hampshire's covered bridges are named after families or people who lived nearby the covered bridge spot, such as the Jurgen Bridge in Sandwich and the Beamant Bridge in, in Bradford. And many of these namesakes were local residents or farmers or, or certainly no one as famous as John Greenleaf Whittier. And I would really like to learn more about Whittier, and I'd like our listeners to learn more about him, too, and the man behind the name. And so let's start at the very beginning of, of Whittier's life. So he was born in 1807 on what is now the Whittier birthplace. Can you give us a picture of what that farm was like when Whittier was a boy? What was his family like? Yes, absolutely. So the the Whittier birthplace, where the museum I work with um, is now located, we have 68 of the original 150 acres that the Whittier family owned um, with woodlots and agricultural fields. The house that is now the museum where Whittier was born was built in 1688 by Thomas Whittier. So our John Greenleaf Whittier is the fourth generation of Whittiers to live on this farm. He is um, one of four siblings. He had an older sister, Mary, a younger sister, Lizzie, and a younger brother, Matthew. Uh, he lived with his two parents. There was also an unmarried uncle, his father's brother, Uncle Moses. His mother's unmarried sister, Aunt Mercy, lived with them as well. And we know that there was also um, farm hands that worked on the property as well. So it was a busy house, lots of people. Uh, Woodier wrote in his autobiography, which is really just a letter that he wrote to a friend kind of outlining his life. But he said, quote, our home was somewhat lonely, half hidden in oak woods with no house in sight. And we had few companions of our age and few occasions of recreation. Our school was only for 12 weeks in a year in the depth of winter and a half mile distant. At an early age, I was set to work on the farm and doing errands for my mother. I would imagine the school was only 12 weeks because they were busy working. Yes, lots of farm chores. They were as self-sufficient as they could be on the farm, growing vegetables, fruit trees, corn, raising livestock. Um, they grew flax that they were able to spin into linen. The wool from the sheep obviously got spun at home. So they tried to do everything they could on the farm to survive. Mm -hmm. And Haverhill was not a very big town at that time, was it? No. So Haverhill today is interesting in that it is urban at its center. It's um, suburban in the middle, and then it's rural on its outskirts. And in Woodier's day, it was still very much a rural community, um, many more farms than we still have today. Um, but the bustling downtown area was growing in his lifetime. And it seems that Whittier's journey into writing 
began when his sister submitted one of his poems without his knowledge to a man who would later become his mentor of of sorts. Can you tell us about that story? Yes. So his older sister, Mary, sent one of his poems when he was a teenager uh, to the Newburyport Free Gazette, which was edited by William Lloyd Garrison, a prominent abolitionist. Uh, Garrison was impressed with the young teenage poet. He printed the poem in his paper. Uh, Woodier received the paper, it got delivered to the house, and he saw his words printed with just the name W at the end. Uh, you know, shocked that his words were in print, didn't know what had gone on. And Garrison was also impressed enough that he wanted to come out and meet the young poet. So he came from Newburyport to Haverhill, which today is about a 20 minute drive. It probably would have taken over an hour on horseback Mm -hmm. to get there. He arrived, was shown into the parlor. Um, Somebody ran out to get uh, young Greenleaf, as he was known in the family. He was out in a field hoeing a row of corn. He was quite dirty. He came running in a back door, quickly got changed um, in the room that he shared with his younger brother, Matthew, so quickly that he put on the wrong pair of pants (laughs) and showed up wearing his little brother's pants um, for his first meeting with William Lloyd Garrison. (laughs) That's that's an excellent story. How old was he? He was about um, 19 at the time. Okay. Uh, but it went really well. Garrison was impressed um, with with meeting him and tried to convince Woodier's father, John Woodier, to send him to the new uh, Haverhill Academy, which is a private high school just about to be opened. His father said, no, uh, poetry will not bring him bread, meaning he's not going to make a living as a poet. So what's the use of sending him to high school? Um, but you know, Garrison persisted. And eventually the father said, well, if he can afford his own tuition, I will agree to let him go. So Woodier learned how to make a simple lady slipper from a shoemaker who was working on the farm. And he sold lady shoes at 12 cents a pair and funded his first year of high school tuition. Wow. Uh, His second year was funded by working as a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse. Again, he hadn't graduated yet. He's already a teacher. Um, And after two years, that's it. He's done. That's the end of his end of his education. That wasn't typical for somebody that age to go to high school, was it? No, I mean, this was a brand new school. Um, Haverhill was just starting to get big enough that having a high school was seen as kind of a prestige thing for the community. Okay. Um, but most people in this time period didn't go to didn't go to high school. They did that one room schoolhouse twelve weeks a year. Do we know what he was learning at the school? Was he honing his writing skills, or was he just trying to graduate from high school? No, he he did. He absolutely did. Um, and he he kind of gained a reputation among the classmates as being the writer among them. When Whittier was in his early twenties, he was writing, I assume, but he also became involved in in politics. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So this William Lloyd Garrison is still part of this story. Um, He helped Whittier get his first job after graduating. He started working on newspapers in the editorial department. Um, He worked at the Boston Manufacturer, which was um, kind of a working man's paper. Um, Oh, sorry, the American Manufacturer based in Boston. Um, He also worked at a newspaper in Hartford, Connecticut for a little while. He eventually later on in his life um, works down in Pennsylvania, down in Philadelphia. He's one of the founders of the Atlantic Monthly Magazine in the 1850s. So he spends his early career working on newspapers and magazines um, and getting very heavily involved in the abolitionist cause. Um, In 1833, He is a founding member of the Haverhill Anti-Slavery Society and the Essex County Anti-Slavery Society and the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he eventually represents um, Massachusetts at the National Convention for the American Anti-Slavery Society as well. So he gets he gets involved. Um, This cause in particular means a lot to him, but. Later on, we see that he's interested also in women's right to vote um, and other um, social causes for his day. So 
he gets involved thanks to Garrison. His first kind of foray into politics seems to be short-lived um, due to what has sometimes been described as nervous e exhaustion uh, or a nervous breakdown that caused him to move back home in 1832. Do, do we know more about what he was struggling with? I don't know precisely what he has, but I know, again, from that autobiography, he wrote, quote, my health was never robust. I inherited from both my parents a sensitive and nervous temperament, and one of my earliest recollections is of a pain in my head from which I've suffered all my life. Mm. I think he spends a lot of time getting really worked into projects to the point where he burns himself out, mm -hmm. and then he ends up retreating home, whether that's home to Haverhill originally or eventually home to Amesbury. And then he gets jumps back in and he gets really into his cause and his writing. And then he wears himself out and he kind of has to take a step back. Mm -hmm. hmm. That sounds terrible. It almost yeah. sounds like, like maybe he had a migraine or. That's kind of my thinking, but yeah. without him using those words, I can't say for right. certain. Right. And I'm sure back then the, the treatments for things like that were. Rest. Primitive at best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh. Uh, Okay. Well, and it seems shortly um, after that, he reconnected with Garrison and then became more involved. And um, can you talk about the the political landscape of the ab abolitionist movement in the in the 1830s and how his writings were part of that climate? Yes, absolutely. He he's involved with the abolitionist cause. And we sometimes think that in the North, we have our abolitionists and everybody's against slavery. And in the South, we've got our slave owners. Um, but it's not as black and white as that, no. that kind of story we learn as kids is. Um, even up here in the North, there were many people who had economic interests in cheap cotton, mm -hmm. um, particularly people that were owners or employed by the textile mills up here in New England. Um, part of Woodier's work was not only writing, but also um, speaking engagements. And I know there's an instance of him going up to Concord, New Hampshire for a speaking engagement with a British abolitionist who was visiting. And they don't, they don't make it to their engagement. The city or the town council, their city or town at the time, um, closes off the venue, the town hall where they're supposed to be speaking just because there's a mob. And they said, nope, never, can't come inside. Wow. So they get chased through the town. They've got rotten vegetables thrown at them and eventually rocks, um, minor injuries, scrapes, that sort of thing. But, you know, Woodier kind of laughs it off. They take refuge in a house of a, of a friend. Um, the house that they were supposed to be staying at, the mob goes there. And they start, you know, banging on the door and causing a ruckus. Um, the woman whose house it was comes outside and says, I have a sick child inside. Please, please leave us alone. <laughs> please, wow. please take your mob somewhere else. Um, she kind of stands, stands down, stares down the mob. Um, they eventually agree to leave. Um, they decide that they're going to go get drunk somewhere else and they find a cannon and they shoot off the cannon. Um, thankfully, there's no recorded instance of anybody getting really hurt or damaged buildings. Um, but Woodier and this British abolitionist sneak off in the early morning hours back down to Haverhill. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is North, this is New Hampshire. Um, it's not that cut and dry, good and bad what's going on, but Woodier's right in the thick of it. Um, that's not the only time he's attacked by mobs. We know it happens in Newburyport. It happens in Boston um, as he's traveling around, but he's, He's continuing with his speaking engagements. He is a ferocious letter writer, and he's writing to all of the um, elected officials in the area, all the wannabe elected officials in the area, trying to persuade them to vote um, on bills to advance abolition. Um, he does represent Haverhill in the Massachusetts state legislature for a short period of time. Um, but again, nervous exhaustion takes him back home. Um, he does a lot of work more from the sideline, kind of advocating other people than being the one um, actually making the laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and it, it sounds like, you know, for somebody in his physical condition, that's a brave thing to do if he's, if he's, you know, easily overwhelmed to be putting himself in public speaking positions where he's being chased out of town by a mob is, I mean, he felt very passionately about this. He does. He, I believe he saw this as his life's work. Uh, you know, today, many people know him as a poet, but I think if we were able to ask him, he would tell us that his life's work was ending slavery. Mm -hmm. And if that's your life's work, then you dedicate your life to making that happen. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I know you, you, we talked a little bit, or, you know, we've already talked about some of the pushback and the violence that he, that he received and, and. I know he lobbied in, in Washington and became editor of the the Philadelphia Freeman. And then it seemed by 1845, he came back home again. What do we know about that? He did. All I can say is it's probably um, that those possible migraines, it's overexertion. Um, I don't know of any triggering event for him to come home, but he does continue to put himself out there. Um in 1844, I think one of his most moving poems that he writes is Farewell of a Virginia Slave Mother to Her Daughters. And it has this repeating stanzas throughout. So every couple of stanzas, it says, gone, gone, sold and gone to the rice swamp dank and lone where the slave whip ceaseless swings where the noisome insect stings, gone, gone, sold and gone. I mean, wow. it's it's moving, even listening to it today. Um, but if that was your first kind of um, experience with what is slavery, for many people in the North, they didn't see it. Right. Um, it's it's moving. So he, he becomes a target in some ways. Um, you know, his, his reputation precedes him wherever he does go. And he may, he may have needed time to come back and mm -hmm. find out a little bit. That narrative that even people in the North received about slavery was not true. Um, for him to break that and change that and to try to educate people through his verse, that's, that's a risky position. Yes. He, he finds that a lot of his poems um, and even some of his um, prose as well that he writes um, in the years preceding the Civil War, he's unable to get them published. Um, he says, again, in his autobiography, that, indeed, my pronounced views on slavery made my name too unpopular for a publisher's uses. Um, he, can't, he can't get published. He's too radical. Um, they don't, they don't want to go too close to him. They say they're going to lose subscribers and get angry letters. And wow, he, he's, he's a radical dude. After about 1845, it, it seems like there was a book written by Barrett Wendell in 1893 that indicated that he, Whittier didn't stray too far from the family homestead in Amesbury much af after that. Um, he would vacation out at the Isles of Shoals, which are a group of islands off of the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. Uh, he would go to Boston. And then, of course, he would come to Ossipee, which is where our story's headed. And, yes. Uh, do, we, do we know how he found Ossipee? I don't know exactly how he found it. Um, I've been reading through a couple of his biographies, and I found that he was there each summer, late summer, um, sometimes late August, usually into September between 1875 and 1880. Um, and he's often there with his niece and her friends and other poets of the day. Lucy Larkham shows up a lot. Um, so it's kind of this literary, mostly younger crowd. Um, he's kind of the, the old guy there, but he's very much welcomed um, along with their group. A lot of the activities that the younger people do during the daytime he kind of sits back, but he catches up with them in the evening around the fireside. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. <laughs> and I think late summer is a good time to come to the woods it's of beautiful. New Hampshire because May is not. Yeah. I mean, the bugs are, the bugs are not as bad. <laughs> exactly. um, 
he notes particularly in 1880 that the mountains never looked as lovely that year during sunrise and sunset as he had ever seen. Wow. Do we, this is kind of a little off topic, but do, did he ever indicate in any of his writings why he never married? I think he was just unlucky in love. Hmm. We know from one of his poems um, called In School Days that he does admit later on is semi-true and that the man in the poem is him. Um, but the poem is kind of a story of uh, school-age kids um, having a child awkward kind of flirt love story. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the end of the poem, you find out that the young girl in the poem died young. Oh. So that was unlucky. That's I know sad. one of his other friends um, that he met at Haverhill Academy, there was an interest between the two of them. And her father said, he, 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 you are not marrying a poor possible poet. Oh. I have better plans for you. She then shows up in one of, in the audience of one of his speaking engagements. Um, and they have kind of those, what could have been moments, wow. which reminds me of his poem, Maud Muller, that the saddest words of tongue or pen, the saddest of these are what might have been. Hmm. So I think he had interest and it just never worked out for him. Oh, wow. That's sad. It is. So sad. But he had a full life. He had lots of friends, um, was close with his, his sisters, his nieces, um, was never truly alone. Right. Well, and it, it sounds like, you know, his, his childhood was lonely. On that farm. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems that he enjoyed his time in Ossipi. He was there in between 1875 and 1880. And the covered bridge, the current Whittier Bridge that's still there today was constructed it was constructed after October of 1869. So 1870 is the date that we settled on. We haven't seen actual documents about when it was actually constructed, but there was a uh, pretty significant flood in October of 1869 that destroyed several bridges and covered bridges in that Sandwich, Conway, um, Ossipee area. So when he was there, the bridge was brand new. Do you know if the bridge had a different name before it was given his name? It has also been referred to as the Bear Camp River Bridge because okay. that's the water that it that it spans. I'm assuming they didn't call it the Whittier Bridge when he was living. I'm, there I'm assuming summer, that. But, well. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And I, God, I, wouldn't it be nice to talk to him or wish he wrote this down because we don't know who built it either. So mm. we would really like to know that. Um, so if you find that anywhere, that'd be good to know. I'll, I'll keep looking. <laughs> We know that he stayed at the Bear Camp River House, and it seems that he came back every summer until that house burned down. What what do we know about his time here? From what I've read, uh, he was there at the Bear Camp River House until September of 1880, and the hotel burned shortly after he left, okay. which does sound a little suspicious, <laughs> but I don't think he had anything to do with it. Um I also found out that the Bear Cant River House um, accommodated 75 guests okay. at 7 to $14 a week. Wow. And the hotel was finally situated near the West Ospe Rail Station in the Bear Camp River in a pleasant and quiet neighborhood. And this comes from the White Mountains, a handbook for travelers by M.F. Sweeter yeah. in 1876. So That's right at the time that Whittier was staying there. That's great. Whittier wrote several poems during his time in Ossipi, which included how they climbed Chikoroa, Sunset on the Bear Camp, Voyage of the Jetty, The Seeking of the Waterfall. And they all capture his experiences and his impressions during that time in Ossipi, but his writing changed significantly after the Civil War. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, as I mentioned before, his early pre-Civil War writing is very much about um, abolishing slavery and that end. So most of his poems are um, 
they can be graphic at times. Um, thinking of the gone, gone, sold and mm. gone. Um, they describe some really awful scenes for people that are not witnessing it in person. It's a way to, to help educate them. Um, but then the Civil War brings an end to slavery. The 13th and 14th Amendments are passed. And his life's work is complete, but he's only in his 60s. Um, he's got more life ahead of him. His mother died shortly before the Civil War. Mm. His beloved sister, Lissy, dies in the middle of the war. So he's he's not in a great place mentally. Um, and the country itself is trying to pull itself back together. So he's kind of drawing from happier times when he sits down to write what becomes his most famous poem, Snowbound. Mm -hmm. um, it's published in 1866, and it describes a blizzard raging outside on the family farm while multiple generations are gathered around the fireplace, swapping stories as the snow swirls outside. And it's a bestseller in his day. Everything he writes after is also a bestseller. And this is where we see the transformation of Whittier from the radical abolitionist to the fireside poet. Okay. What do you think it is about that, that poem that resonated with people? So it's written during Reconstruction. It's written during the Industrial Revolution. There's a lot of people looking back at what they see as better times. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they grew up on a, a nice family farm and now they're in a crowded, dirty city. And they're saying, man, things were better when we were kids. <laughs> it's that nostalgia right. that people look back on. All generations do it. Mm -hmm. uh, they look back and say, yeah, that was a good time. Right. Wish we could go back to that. Um, he's writing what a lot of people are feeling. So I like to, to compare him to rock stars or pop stars of today. You know, if you listen to a Taylor Swift song and think, man, she's writing about my life. How does she know? <laughs> That's what Whittier is doing for his generation. Right. Right. And, and I think that's important for people to understand that the bridge is named after him for a reason. He was, he was a very famous person. He, his fan club, official fan club was started during his lifetime. Wow. Yeah, it's called the Whittier Club. Technically, it's still in existence today, although they don't meet quite as often as they used to. But you know, he, he has all the locations around the new Ossipee area, the Whittier Bridge, Mount Whittier, the Whittier Highway, uh, Whittier, Alaska, Whittier, California are named after him. Mm -hmm. There's neighborhoods in Minneapolis and Denver that are named for him. Like his name is everywhere. Yeah. And the majority of those places he probably never visited. No, he never went to. Right. Um, he was, the the people in California did ask his permission to put his name on their town. And he sent them back a, sh a short poem that basically says, I have nothing to give you but my name, but you can have it. <laughs> um, and they set aside a plot of land for him, but he never goes out to visit. Wow. That's, I mean, I, and I, I guess that's, that's the, that's the history piece, right? You know, when we think about names and places and namesakes, they were given for a reason and a sig significant connection. And I, I feel like for this covered bridge, I mean, I just, I picture him standing on it, walking across it, sitting yeah. underneath of it. Looking at the sunset on the bear camp. Absolutely. Absolutely. After the bear camp river house burns down, uh, Whittier does not come back to Ossipee. In fact, he dies three years later in New Hampshire at a friend's home. Do What do we know about the end of Whittier's life? He inherits the farm from his father when his father dies in 1830 as the oldest son. But he hates farming. So he pretty quickly finds first someone else to run the farm. And then eventually he sells the farm and he moves to Amesbury. He moves with his mom, Aunt Mercy and his younger sister, Lizzie. Um, they live there um, through the Civil War. Aunt Mercy dies in the 1840s. His mother dies in the 1850s. And Lizzie dies in the 1860s. After his sister, Lizzie, dies, 
his niece, Lizzie, daughter of his brother, Matthew, moves in to keep house for him. Okay. But after Lizzie's marriage to Samuel Picard, who is kind of the official biographer of Whittier, he writes the first um, biography of him. Um, Whittier then rents out most of his home in Amesbury to another Quaker couple. He does keep kind of one room to keep some of his stuff in, and he visits occasionally, but he mostly moves in with cousins in Danvers, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, their house is called Oak Knoll. So from Oak Knoll, mostly in the winter time, he then takes his kind of vacations around New England. He goes to the Isle of Shoals when Oak, when Oak Knoll gets too hot. He then leaves the Isle of Shoals when it gets too crowded and goes up to Ossipee. And I know from some of his other poems, he's written about Lake Winnipesaukee. He's written about Sunapee. So he does travel around more the state of New Hampshire as well. And he's staying with um, friends in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire, when he dies in September of 1892. Do we know how he died? Old age, as far as I know. And that was, yeah, that was an official cause of death. Yeah. Yeah. And he was 85? Almost, almost 85. He, his birthday is in December. So he died um, three months before his 85th birthday. Well, that's, that's a long life in 1892. Yes. A long and full life. Yeah, absolutely. I know you have some stories about his time there. Yes. In, in particular, relating to his, um, his poem, How They Climbed Shakora. Okay. Um, I found out a little digging on how that poem came to be. So from what I read in Roland Woodwell's biography of him, um, he said that one night they were sitting around the inn's fire and Whittier had the tongs in his possession as usual. Woodwell does not explain why that's the case does he always have the tongs to the fire i don't know i was intrigued and i wished he'd had a little bit more information but woodier apparently always has the fire tongs in hand the ladies planned to hike chakora with one of their sons and a stable boy from the inn they hiked to the tree line they set up camp and then they listened to bears growling and quote other terrible sounds all night the next day, they reached the peak, and then they returned all the way down uh, back to the inn that evening to tell Whittier about their stories. He then wrote how they climbed Chakora mm -hmm. in response, and he shared it to Lucy Larkham, who was one of the women um, at the Bear Camp River House, and she shared the poem, quote, from an unknown author with some of her other friends around New England via letters. She received responses a couple days later, and the author, one of the responses um, said the author must have scared away the bear with his verses and got caught in the bear trap by his coattails, meaning <sighs> this poem is so bad, the bears must have run away, <laughs> not knowing that this poem was written by Whittier. <laughs> oh, my God. So then Whittier decides he's going to write um, what he calls the last will and testament of the man in the bear trap in response. <laughs> and he does this around the fire at night and proceeds to include everybody in attendance in the room as a beneficiary in this fake will, including the in stable boy. That's funny. And then this gets shared around. Um, but then Woodier has to kind of backtrack a little bit because he's afraid that Samuel Picard, his nephew-in-law, is going to print this in his newspaper in Portland, Maine. And he said, he asked Picard to not publish the quote, foolish verses, which were hardly consistent with his years and eminent gravity. They're like, I'm going to be named a fool. <laughs> if you print this. That's a great story. But, but yet uh, Roland Woodwell prints it in his book a hundred years later. <laughs> so the story gets out. And do you have a personal connection to Ossipee also? I do. My family has a house on Lake Ossipee. Wow. What are the odds of that? 
pretty good, actually. There's a lot of people from Haverhill that vacation in the Alsophy area. Oh, okay. All right. So that still happens. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> still today. Wow. And the Bear Camp House is obviously gone, and but the bridge is there. But the Whittier birthplace is still there, and people can visit. Can you talk about the property and what people can expect and how they can see you? Yes. So we are officially open, um, at least inside, May to October. But our grounds, we have 68 of the original 150 acres owned by the Whittier family. Our grounds are open year round. Um, we have a, one guided trail, but you know you can explore through the woods and fields as much as you like. We encourage people to come on snowshoes or bring their dogs on leash um, to come and explore the outdoor space. Um, one of the, the guided trail that we have has 13 stops. It's about a half mile loop. And each stop has a piece from either Whittier's poetry that describes the scenery that you're looking at or comes from one of his earlier biographers like Picard. So you get to see the birthplace through Whittier's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, during the summer months, we offer tours by reservation of the historic house. And then we offer um, a full event calendar throughout the year. So in the springtime, we've been doing a series of food ways programs where we have a talk and a taste and people get to kind of learn a little bit about the history of certain food items. We've had beekeepers presenting and talking about honey. Uh, we have a chocolate historian coming up in a couple months. So we're looking forward to those. We also do a lot of poetry readings both of Whittier's poems and um, contemporary poets within the Haverhill community and um, school field trips that come through. So we're excited to share the legacy of Whittier's poetry and his abolition work with the community. That's excellent. Any last thoughts or any last, lasting impressions you'd like people to have of John Greenleaf Whittier? I think now that people have heard a little bit more about Whittier, they're going to start to notice his name in a lot of places. I know that I do, that I end up turning down a Whittier road that I never expected. Um, you'll start to see his name everywhere because he traveled so much around New England. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have his name permanently ensconced on the Whittier Covered Bridge in Ossipee. And the Whittier Bridge has had quite a journey uh, of its of its own. It, it has recently been put back across the river after being um, next to the river for many, many years uh, waiting for, for funding. And so it's, it's recently reopened, which is a joy to see. That's excellent. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Keep listening to hear two of John Greenleaf Whittier's poems read by my friend Clark Dewing. The first is Sunset on the Bear Camp, written in 1876. A gold fringe on the purpling hem of hills, the river runs, as down its long green valleys falls the last of summer suns. Along its tawny gravel bed, broad flowing, swift and still, as if its meadow levels felt the hurry of the hill. Noiseless between its banks of green, from curve to curve it slips. The drowsy maple shadows rest like fingers on its lips. A waif from Carol's wildest hills, unstoried and unknown, the ursine legend of its name prowls on its banks alone. Yet flowers as fair its slopes adorn as ever Yarrow knew, or under rainy Irish skies, by Spencer's mullah grew, and through the gaps of leaning trees, its mountain cradle shows the gold against the amethyst, the green against the rose, touched by a light that hath no name, a glory never sung, aloft on sky and mountain wall, are God's great pictures hung. How changed the summits vast and old, no longer granite browed, they melt in rosy mist. The rock is softer than the cloud. The valley holds its breath. No leaf of all its elms is twirled. The silence of eternity seems falling on the world. 
The pause before the breaking seals of mystery is this. Yon miracle play of night and day makes dumb its witnesses. What unseen altar crowns the hills that reach up stair on stair? What eyes look through? What white wings fan these purple veils of air? What presence from the heavenly heights to these of earth stoops down? Not vainly Hellas dreamed of gods on Ida's snowy crown. Slow fades the vision of the sky. The golden water pales, and over all the valley land a gray-winged vapor sails. I go the common way of all. The sunset fires will burn. The flowers will blow. The river flow when I no more return. No whisper from the mountain pine nor lapsing stream shall tell the stranger treading where I tread of him who loves them well. But beauty seen is never lost. God's colors all are fast. The glory of this sunset heaven into my soul has passed. A sense of gladness unconfined to mortal date or clime. As the soul liveth, it shall live beyond the years of time. Beside the mystic asphodels shall bloom the home-born flowers. And new horizons flush and glow with sunset hues of ours. Farewell. These smiling hills must wear too soon their wintry frown, and snow-cold winds from off them shake the maple's red leaves down. But I shall see a summer sun still setting broad and low. The mountain slopes shall blush and bloom, the golden water flow. A lover's claim is mine on all I see to have and hold. The rose light of perpetual hills and sunsets never cold. And next, The Seeking of the Waterfall, written in 1878. They left their home of summer ease beneath the lowland sheltering trees to seek, by ways unknown to all, the promise of the waterfall. Some vague, faint rumor to the veil had crept, perchance a hunter's tale, of its wild mirth of waters lost on the dark woods through which it tossed. Somewhere it laughed and sang, somewhere whirled in mad dance its misty hair. But who had raised its veil or seen the rainbow skirts of that undine? They sought it where the mountain brook its swift way to the valley took. Along the rugged slope they clomb, their guide a thread of sound and foam. Height after height they slowly won. The fiery javelins of the sun smote the bare ledge. The tangled shade with rock and vine their steps delayed. But through leaf openings, now and then they saw the cheerful homes of men and the great mountains with their wall of misty purple guiding all. The leaves through which the glad winds blew shared the wild dance the waters knew. And where the shadows deepest fell, the wood thrush rang his silver bell. Fringing the stream, at every turn swung low the waving fronds of fern. From stony cleft and mossy sod, pale asters sprang, and goldenrod. And still the water sang the sweet, glad song that stirred its gliding feet, and found in rock and root the keys of its beguiling melodies, fainter voice, the brook still bade them listen, pause, and look. Meanwhile below the day was done, above the tall peaks saw the sun sink, beam shorn to its misty set behind the hills of violet. Here ends our quest, the seekers cried. The brook and rumor both have lied. The phantom of a waterfall has led us at its beck and call. But one, with years grown wiser, said, So, always baffled, not misled, we follow where before us runs the vision of the shining ones. Not where they seem their signals fly, their voices while we listen die. We cannot keep, however fleet, the quick time of their winged feet. From youth to age unresting stray, these kindly mockers in our way. Yet lead they not, the baffling elves, to something better than themselves? Here, 
Though unreached the goal we sought, its own reward or toil has brought the winding water's sounding rush, the long note of the hermit thrush, the turquoise lakes, the glimpse of pond and river track, and, vast, beyond broad meadows belted round with pines, the grand uplift of mountain lines. What matter though we seek with pain the garden of the gods in vain? If lured thereby we climb to great, some wayside blossom Eden sweet, to seek is better than to gain. The fond hope dies as we attain. Life's fairest things are those which seem. The best is that of which we dream. Then let us trust our waterfall still flashes down its rocky wall with rainbow crescent curved across its sunlit spray from moss to moss. And we, forgetful of our pain, in thought shall seek it oft again, shall see this aster blossomed sod, the sunshine of the golden rod, and haply gain through parting boughs, grand glimpses of great mountain brows, cloud turbaned, and the sharp steel sheen of lakes deep set in valleys green. So failure wins. The consequence of loss becomes its recompense. And evermore the end shall tell the unreached ideal guided well. Our sweet illusions only die, fulfilling love's sure prophecy. And every wish for better things and undreamed beauty nearer brings. For fate is servitor of love. Desire and hope and longing prove the secret of immortal youth, and nature cheats us into truth. O kind allurers, wisely sent, beguiling with benign intent, still move us through divine unrest to seek the loveliest and the best. Go with us when our souls go free, and in the clear, white light to be. Add on to heaven's beatitude, the old delight of seeking good. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening. Thank you.